Uh, I guess my uh, website needs to be updated. Um, that was 10 years ago, and um, the story behind it, of course, is that the article was written by my husband, Stephen Reed, um, <laughs> who was in a maximum security prison um, for his work in banks. And um, <laughs> he, <laughs> he hadn't seen any women, let alone any beautiful or interesting ones, so he, he got a lot of brownie points with that. So I, I uh, put it on my website. Unfortunately, I have to now explain it every time I get introduced. Like, so okay, this is where it came from, unless you, lest you think Playboy has revised its, its idea of ideal beauty, which, of course, would be lovely, but I don't think they have. And uh, my husband got out yesterday after another 18-year stint. Um, yeah, and I'm not there. Uh, but he's gone to a, another long treatment program at Salvation Army and um, is finding the world quite busy. I said, yes, it is. Um, but this is a poem. Um, I, again, I don't really know why I was chosen to read at this amazing oracular, is that the word, event, Spanish night, but I do have a poem called No Ablo in Glace. Um, <laughs> so it felt like a natural, and it's my imaginary conversation to the judge um, after Stephen was sentenced in 1999 to 18 years. Um, uh, the poet Al Pittman is mentioned, and Al was a Newfoundland poet who liked his drink. Uh, as they say in Ireland, he had a great strength for the weakness. And, uh, <laughs> to, yeah. So, what I want to say to his honor, who sentenced the father of my children to 18 years for armed robbery is, let's just let bygones be bygones, be by, 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 he'll be gone so long, but it doesn't come out that way. Instead, I say, it's not like he knocked off a food bank, your honor, nobody's going to bed hungry. The first time this parole officer comes to my house to see if I'm the kind of woman suitable to be visiting her better half in the bucket, he won't shake hands due to it being flu season, a titch, touchy. Your honor, having a parole officer in your house is like going through airport security without leaving home. Jokes bomb as mightily as the US forces in Afghanistan. Political poetry tends to date. You can substitute Iraq or Libya or whatever you want there. That's the problem with, with politics, isn't it? Uh, anyway, it was Afghanistan at the time. Last week, leaving Deer Lake, Newfoundland, the security guards made me gulp down my bottled Evian water to prove it wasn't a controlled substance. My fault for pointing out Evian is naive spelled backwards. Like the sign says, joking is a criminal offense punishable by whatever it takes to make a person think twice before being a comedian. This encourages me. I say, heard any good jokes lately to the comedian in front of me who looks seriously like the dead poet Al Pittman, and he cracks to me it is taking so long to get through security, he is afraid his forged passport is going to expire. <laughs> After which the drug and bomb squad pit bulls are onto him taking formidable bites out of his right to remain silent. Al confesses he returned from the dead without remembering to warn anyone and is flying back to Kandahar under the alias Bin Pittman, which is why he wears the t-shirt with the many faces of Bin Laden on it inside out. I try to diffuse the situation saying Al joined Al-Qaeda and all he got was this lousy t-shirt. <laughs> I actually have a t-shirt that says that, and I'm really tempted to wear it crossing the border, but I haven't had the nerve. I got stopped in Winnipeg because I have a t-shirt with a gun on it, and uh, it's from Smoking Lily in Victoria, it's their insignia, and they told me I shouldn't wear that when I was flying. And uh, I said, but my other, my hoodie that I had to do up has two guns on the back, and they said, don't say that word! Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Anyway, where was I? Um, Robert Lowell used to stop in the middle of poems and start explaining how hysteria and uterus were the same. You know, come, I, I learned so much listening to him read, but um, I get sidetracked myself. Okay, where was I? Uh, um, blah, blah, blah. Um, lousy t-shirt. But then, when it is my turn to be interrogated, I err on the side of terror and swallow the one bag I haven't packed myself, a small bag of white powder a criminal lawyer in St. John's has given me as a going-away gift. <laughs> The false sense of security guard starts sniffing around and suddenly I feel a new solidarity with Al, going away for good to the jug in Corner Brook. So I get all Joan baez proactive singing, ban the bomb, 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 he'll be gone so long, until I cough up the gift bag of white powder, a sodden bath bomb with souvenir of the rock written on it for the love of Allah, so arrest me, why don't you? These are desperate times. 
If you want my opinion, they should detain all passengers who don't board the aircraft, joking. A sense of humor should be a prerequisite for anyone flying Air Canada these days. <laughs> Your Honor, when I offer this parole officer coffee, he says, I don't use caffeine, as if I've just suggested we inject heroin with a turkey baster. <laughs> Then he goes, you ever consider therapy? Like I must be some kind of case to stand by a man who steals honest money from an ATM to make ends meet. I don't miss a beat. I spent 20 years in analysis until my therapist finally said three words that would forever change my life. He said, no hablo inglés. <laughs> An old joke, your honor, but a good one. Ever notice when you cut therapists in two, you get thee and rapist? I can't, go, I know it's true, it's really scary, how half of analysis is anal. When you analyze it that way, I don't need some badass parole officer repeating how my better half is bad, badder, and baddest. Why couldn't he try putting my kid's dad in some kind of positive historical context? I mean, he ain't bad like Hitler was bad, not like Stalin bad, Attila the Hun bad, Jack the Ripper or George the Bush bad, not half as bad as the batter Meinhof gang. Furthermore, I say to him, when was the last time you you went into a bank feeling holy. That's when this excuse for a parole officer pulls out his correction services Canada pen and writes that I am a minimizer of my spousal equivalent's crimes. Unsuited to visit said spousal equivalent due to my non-deferential attitude and negative influencing factors. Your Honor, I had three words to say to said parole officer after that. No hablo inglés. Thank you very much. And Sherry D promises that we will both come and read together one day if we live another 10 years or so, um, Stephen and me. Um, he, even when he was out of prison, would always dream that I was being unfaithful to him. I guess this is what people do when they live together. And even though I wasn't, it was so maddening always to be, have somebody not speak to you all day because you cheated on them in, in, in their dream. And um, <laughs> So this is a poem called Ice Age Lingerie, and um, it's kind of about that, I guess, and other things. I um, won a contest where you had to have the word a, a, a panty or lingerie in the poem, and I won first prize, so I became known as the panty poet, which was really humiliating because, you know, you want something else, really. That doesn't, didn't suit my idea of myself, put it that way, but anyway. Last night you dreamed I drove off with a philosophical taxi driver. This time you knew I was leaving you for good. In your dreams, I betray you every chance I get. Why can't you dream I stay with you just for once? Those who do not wish to kill anyone wish they were able, wrote some long ago Roman observing the darker side of human nature. In your dream, I am wearing ice age lingerie, oblivious to the effects of global warming. My bra began to thaw as we entered Central Park in that hot yellow cab with matching airbags, my driver being for the future. While suddenly in the back, I became so much older, like one of those people who like to get to the airport early. And my panties melted into a pool at my feet, where centuries later, archeologists would uncover the intimate remains of a woman who once tore up Sixth Avenue tossing away her constricting under things. In your dream, you felt excluded because I kept driving around all night while you had your mind set on finding a parking meter. Could this mean we were incompatible, you said, as my driver began to resemble Harvey Keitel st starring in The Bad Lieutenant. And he was just like in the movie with his philosophy of life, you can take the girl out of the cheap underwear, but you can't take the cheap underwear out of the girl. I said I would forgo a receipt if he would shut off his meter and join me in the back. I probably do have a spiritual nature, but in the back seat I can be wholly animal. As your dream ended, I was naked, in critical care, with Harvey in the same bed, smoking. A sign above my life support system read, visitors to the dying must use the payphone at the end of the hall where the smoking room used to be. But you didn't have the nerve to ask Harvey to butt out, because he was for the future, which is where you woke up, in pathology between shipping and receiving, where nothing I could do would be enough to make you warm. Everything in your life came together so perfectly at that moment, it would be forever tinged with grief. Two days later, I made up my mind to lose weight without ever gaining it back again on an ice cream diet, and you were arrested for armed robbery. Toodaloo. Those were Harvey Kay's last words to me on his deathbed, too. Toodaloo.
They were apparently Allen Ginsberg's last words I read in the National Post when he, so I thought those would be pretty good last words. Mine's probably going to be, oh shit, I hope nobody's there to record. Emily Dickinson's, we must go in now, the fog is rising. Who would be that together to be able to say that? <laughs> Jeff. This is the final poem, called, it's called Rest Area, No Loitering, and Other Signs of the Times. I, I'm a compulsive sign reader wherever I go. I'm sure most people, if you write, you read signs, right? Because they're always so interesting. I like that, Rest Area, No Loitering. I think that was in Miami. Um, yeah, it's about being Canadian. I was born in California, but my parents were Canadian. But I, I poke fun at both of our countries, I think. It's just what, it, you, know, what you have to do in order to stay sane. So laugh about it all. Pick your rut carefully, you will be in it for the next 80 miles, warned a sign on a stretch of bad road near head smashed in Buffalo Jump, Alberta. I love my country, because even though we have been called the Vichy Soise of nations, cold, half French, and difficult to stir, <laughs> we are honestly everything we pretend to be, one nation of 80 ethnic groups who still base our fashion taste on what doesn't itch. If the United States is like the guy at the party who gives everyone cocaine and still can't get anybody to like him, <laughs> present company excluded, of course, <clears throat> north of the 49th parallel, where all our Christmases are white, Canadians are the life of the party. God gave us memories so we could have roses in winter, they say in Manitoba, but on Vancouver Island we know the cold of a Canadian winter can kill even a memory. Gather ye rosebuds was my old father's best advice. The average Canadian considers life too short to stuff a mushroom, thinks poutine is French cuisine, is too polite to take the last piece of Christmas cake from the plate, the last pierogi from the pot. The average Canadian says, I'm sorry, 4.8 times a minute. <laughs> We are a self-effacing nation, a well-mannered lot. Americans say no to drugs. Canadians say no, thank you. <laughs> we are not elitists, says our former governor general. Ask anyone who matters. <laughs> Canadians are unarmed Americans with health care. <laughs> A uh, sign on the door of the Ontario legislature reads, warning to all personnel, firings will continue until morale improves. <laughs> Red Fox said health nuts are going to feel stupid someday, lying in hospital dying of nothing, but the unarmed in Canada will be covered. If I had my life to live over, I'd live over Haida Bucks in Masset, and our code there is ZMT. Can you imagine? <laughs> Yours is what, CCY? YYC, so we're, we're ZMT, I love it. I don't think it's anywhere, ZMT for the Americans in the audience. Anyway, uh, if I had my life to live over, I'd live over Haida Bucks in Masset. They were sued by Starbucks, by the way, for using Starbucks name. It's quite funny. We have 900 people in town. Order skim milk latte made from organic shade-grown beans only. Whenever I felt lonely, I'd drive down to Margaret's Cafe in Queen Charlotte City, where a sign immemorial says, tomorrow has been cancelled due to lack of interest. I'd order spaghetti to go. What person on this planet can feel lonely while eating spaghetti? My new philosophy for the millennium? Dread one day at a time. Wake up on New Year's Day and smell what's left of the roses. Pick your rut carefully, but remember, better to be behind a police car than in front of one. When you die, there is going to be a big vacuum in your life, so make hay while the sun still shines through the ozone layer. Raise a glass to the future. Taste the stars. Thank you.